good evening all and a warm welcome to all viewers joining us for today's webinar i am gajanan shirinshi along with dr mangesh balirao head of medical services on bf of rpg life sciences i welcome all for today's informative webinar on blasting role in allergic airway disease it's my pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for today's webinar a renowned pulmonologist dr parag mehta welcome sir pleasure having you here today with us to give you a brief introduction about dr parag mehta uh, dr mehta has completed mbbs and dpcb course from government medical college baroda subsequently he achieved his dnp degree in respiratory medicine from jaslok hospital and research center dr mehta is consultant pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at uh, chest clinic cost chest clinic dr mehta secured fellowship in critical care from jaslok hospital he is the first mumbai ker god distinction to receive the american american academy of sleep medicine and prestigious fellowship training in sleep medicine dr mehta is the first indian chest physician to secure a european respiratory society training fellowship in interventional pulmonology at germany uh, sir is a member of uh, various society like as indian chest society indian association for bronchology european respiratory society and american academy of sleep medicine so it would be very interesting to listen more on this interesting topic so without further wasting more time i would like to welcome dr mehta and request please carry for the session thank you sir over to you yeah good evening everybody and thank you for the kind introduction and the warm welcome i hope that uh, i am able to shed some light on today's topic that is you know the role of bilastin in allergic airway diseases i am primarily a respiratory physician and so airway disease is my forte and i do have a special interest as well as a huge amount of practice in that and so we will also be able to talk on a practical basis what we see on a day to day um, thing uh, i won't focus much on the role of belasting in other allergic disorders especially the dermat part uh, and and the gi part because that is out of my domain and um, uh, so let us first you know have some basic understanding of the idea of a uh, concept of allergy and atopy and uh, what is sensitization so i i believe that almost all of us have been using these words very often and coming across them time and again in our practices as well as in our academics so uh, what exactly is atopy atopy is basically a genetic predilection or a genetic susceptibility to produce a specific ige now everybody is knowing what is an ig or a antibody and so we all know that you know our body has a cell mediated immunity and a humoral immune response and a part of the humoral immune response is basically the production of antibodies or the ig and so we have about five igs or immunoglobulins and one of them is ige which you know deals with the allergy pathways or the behavior in which happens on following or following the exposure to a specific foreign protein or a foreign material and that is where the tendency to have this uh, production of a specific ig against uh, any protein which is not identified previously by the system is known as uh, atopy you know so that's a genetic predisposition or a systemic kind of a pre existing programmed kind of a thing what is sensitization sensitization is somebody is already atopic or or the, you know or receptive about it and then you have you know once a kind of particular individual get exposed to some form of a, a allergen or uh, a sensitization is you know kind of identification or labeling of or uh, that allergen or that protein or that molecule as a foreign one by that person's immunity or that human being's immunity and his immune complex is or immune complex system that this is a foreign protein or this is a protein which can be you know uh, identified later on so it is it gets registered in the memory cells of the body 
and that is how you know sensitization is the process by which whenever you know initially in your infancy and your early childhood you are exposed to a lot of environmental uh, uh, kind of changes and your body keeps on registering all those changes and all those kind of chemicals as well as organisms as well as proteins which it comes across and your body has a remarkable capacity in its humoral and cell mediated immune systems to register all of this and keep it in your memory cells so that is all all about sensitization now allergy is considered as when you somebody is already sensitized uh, and you know then they develop clinical manifestations of the immune complexes or the immune system of the body responding to that particular protein or that particular allergen you know so an individual is considered to be having a clinically significant allergy or allergic disease when they have both things so I, they should have allergen specific ige which should be identifiable on uh, their serum as well as also they would be having symptoms which are clinically manifest at various sites now so that is where we come to you know where allergy or whether it is a nasal predominant or a respiratory lower respiratory predominant manifestation or whether it is a dermatological kind of an allergy which you are manifesting in that particular individual and once you have that that is properly defined as an allergic kind of an event uh, some of the common allergic diseases, you know, we already have talked about uh, so allergic rhinitis, asthma. We also have this drug allergy and, you know, allergy to certain toxins or venoms. That is also uh, very kind of uh, well registered and it is, you know, well described in literature. So it is not necessary that it always has to be something palatable or something inhalable, you know, or touchable. So toxins can be in any form. So that was a brief about what is allergy and atopy and sensitization. I hope I'm clear on that front. Now, the next thing which comes about is, you know, what is known as the allergic march. As you can see on your slide out here, that the allergic march is something or the atopic march is, uh, you know, uh, a temporal progression or, you know, a growth or a kind of a development or evolution of allergic events or allergic phenomena which are clinically manifest in an individual so if you can see in the early age group uh, say up to the age of you know uh, five years you have a uh, you have a significant incidence of this blue line which is you know basically eczema so that is skin allergy but you do tend to have runny nose and sneezing and all and uh, uh, interestingly, you know, though the incidence out here may be 2% as, you know, labeled, but uh, let me tell you that, you know, probably this should be rising much earlier. It is also a very simple and easier way for uh, uh, inhaled allergens to be registered faster. It is, of course, clinically less manifest than asthma. So early childhood wheezing or you know preschool toddlers wheezing away is a very common phenomena described in uh, medical practices and uh, it has major significance and importance in terms of pediatrics uh, practices and you know its outcome does impact uh, in a big way the quality of life of these young uh, humans so if you are able to influence that, you know, you'll be able to make a long-term impact and on their kind of day-to-day uh, -day activities and day-to-day -day livelihood or living. Uh, food allergies, you know, they peak up early in life and then they start gradually, you know, plateauing out over a period of uh, the youth. And uh, they are not so common as we see in terms of, you know, incidence compared to either dermat or skin allergies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, respiratory allergen kind of manifestation. But uh, nonetheless, they do remain significant. And, uh, you know, uh, in our country or in Southeast Asian countries for that matter, we do have a huge amount of uh, undiagnosed or unidentified food allergy being uh, kind of, you know, um, existing for a long period of time. It has not gone 
into the books or it has not been registered well because allergy is still developing in its kind of practices out here and we are yet to beat or reach the levels at which the western population is aware about it and is being diagnosed and treated nonetheless uh, we need to accept that there are a lot of bachus and children and young people also who tend to have food allergies and allergies to food constituents like gluten or whey protein or soya protein or even nuts and legumes you know so uh, that is something which is very much there and which is something which we cannot ignore so that was uh, and so coming to the concept of a united airway so the mucosal lining which starts say from the external respiratory nerve all the way till you know the uh, uh, till you reach the functional unit that is the alveolus uh, uh, not a very not the same kind of uh, kind of uh, continuum of epithelium the nature of the epithelium keeps on changing no doubt but the manifestations uh, tend to remain very similar you know so if somebody has a nasal allergy they will have hyper uh, they will have hyper secretion of nasal mucus uh, discharge and you know they tend to have congestion and inflammation in the local airway in the local pathways and they will tend to have a lot of sneezing and itching uh, a very similar event across in the throat as well as in the larynx and Uh, in the tracheobronchial tree, for that matter, which obviously we identify it as asthma uh, or allergic asthma, to be more specific. And so the World Allergy Organization came out with the concept of a united airway, that you know to make things easier and simpler in terms of clinical management, uh, as well as in scientific approach. that you know bifurcating the compartmentalization of the respiratory tract into upper airway and lower airway in terms of airway allergic disorders is something not very specific or not very required you know and because of that what has happened is it has therapeutic implications also it has diagnostic implications also so inflammatory markers like exhaled nitric oxide have been used to assess inflammation existing in nasal allergies as well as in asthma and similarly it has also been kind of used in therapeutics as in you know we have a common pharmacotherapeutic kind of a overlap uh, not just in symptoms but also in therapy you know you tend to use very similar drugs we will come to that part later on not very far but yeah we will come to it so that was in short about the basics of you know atopy and uh, the single airway or the united airway concept and you know how we go about it uh, we will now come to the specifics so let us start with allergic rhinitis it remains the domain of my uh, ent colleague you know the higher floor colleague my clinic by the way is on the ground floor i am on the lower airway and uh, my first floor uh, is shared by my ent colleague Uh, we have a couple of ENT friends who are practicing just above us. You know? So we have, in actuality, you know, we are a lower airway and they are the upper airway. So patients do come from lower airways to upper airways, upper airways to lower airways. That keeps on happening in references also, in uh, terms of you know this uh, allergic airway disorder. And uh, you know that's really kind of interesting, and at times it becomes intriguing also. You have a nagging cough. or you have an unexplained kind of a sputum production when you are looking at your domain primarily trying to find a cause but you realize that okay you have hit a plateau and you are not able to investigate further there is nothing left to be done okay let us check out with our upper floor colleagues or they decide that let us see what the uh, lung specialist has to say in this kind of a nagging cough and that is how we come across you know commonality of work coming to allergic rhinitis so basically rhinitis is inflammation in the nasal mucosa and so it is basically an ig mediated predominantly ig mediated nasal condition and uh, it generally results from allergen introduction in sensitized individuals we have already talked about what is allergy what is sensitization so i'll not go on that again what are the classical symptoms well nasal congestion rhinorrhea or running nose sneezing 
and they tend to have itching of the nose, palate, throat, ears, you know. In fact, some of them are so itchy that, you know, they just can't stop, uh, you know, touching the nose uh, and uh, mouth. And uh, in fact, of course, so that they are high risk for catching COVID and spreading it around also. Uh, and it is very, very common. Let me tell you, uh, we will come to that. So epidemiology of uh, allergic rhinitis, as you can see out here in this Venn diagram, you know, that maybe asthma would be affecting say about 15% of the general population. But you know, about 40% of allergic rhinitis patients, so that means every one out of two almost of patients who go to an ENT specialist would have a kind of a overlay or an underlay of asthma somewhere. And similarly for us, you know, that allergic rhinitis occurs in almost 80% of patients who have asthma or who are already diagnosed or who are manifesting asthma related symptoms and signs. And so that becomes very important in terms of our practices that you keep that in mind. Where especially so because quite often as I just mentioned before that you hit a plateau in terms of uh, diagnostics and uh, quite often even in terms of therapeutics. And that is where you need to understand that okay this is what we are missing out and you know maybe you know it's always good to take up in on the boat or on the on the cart and you know help it out so that we can you know, do better. How does this kind of go about this process of allergy? It is very common for allergic rhinitis as well as for asthma or air, lower airway reactivity. So a patient or a person would have you know the first phase would primarily be sensitization and the second phase as you can see on the slide is where clinical manifestations come in. Sensitization is clinically silent. You do not understand that what is happening. So the person will be exposed to a particular protein or an allergen for a long, long period of time, as we can see here. The memory cells or the antigen presenting cells or the lymphocytes, you know, they take up the allergen, they present it to the CD4 T cell. Everybody knows what is CD4. So cluster of differentiation is CD. And so they are, you know, the mainstream of our cell-mediated immunity. And so it is not that the, uh, uh, the cell-mediated immunity and the humoral immunity work in different compartments. They are not watertight compartments. They share a lot of work each of, of, of each other. So as you can see here, you know, the CD4 T cells register it. They send, some of them are, you know, some of these cells then pass on the message to the B cells. B cells are the memory cells also. And the B cells then, you know, uh, pass it on to their uh, subsequent generations. The plasma cells are basically subsequent generations of B cell differentiate. And the plasma cells tend to produce the IgE antibody. The IgE antibody is the kind of the central character in this movie of allergy. As according to current medical science and research. And so all pathways, you know, all, all ends of the story go and meet at, uh, at IgE antibodies. And so do our diagnostics focus on it. And our therapeutics also some, in some way or the other try to kind of, you know, reach out to the IgE antibody and its subsequent effect. Till now, we had started off with the uh, peripheral kind of or the symptoms, but now we are seeing a lot of biologics coming into the market. You know, they all are anti IgE antibodies, most of them. So, in the coming year and uh, a couple of years from now on, you know, there is going to be a sea change in therapeutics of allergy, also, primarily related to this that biologics will be stepping in in a big time. But till that point of time, and even after that, we always have to remember that the IgA antibodies, what they do is they pass on the inflammatory signal or, you know, they up switch or switch on the mast cell. And uh, the mast cells, you know, they are the mast cells and the, they, 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 they get stimulated. Uh, they tend to produce inflammatory kind of react cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, predominantly uh, activating the eosinophilia. And they lead to these kind of, you know, acute phase reaction as well as a late phase kind of a reaction in this allergic path. In an acute kind of a setting, you will come across a lot of sneezing. 
mucus production and rhinorrhea or you may also get lower uh, respiratory tract sputum production which is bronchorrhea and basically congestion in the local inflammation in local in inflamed tissue so whether in the sinuses you will find that or even in the bronchial tissue and uh, over a period of time you know uh, that stays for some time then it you know dilutes out or you know fades fades away a little bit or reduces in severity again it rises up uh, on exposure to any allergen or you know or re stimulation by from any other factor also so it's not necessary there are certain allergens uh, which are you know so inconspicuous that we may not have identified them also and so uh, it is a learning process we are still in uh, that phase we are not uh, sort of kind of know it all sort of a position and finally you know so you land up in either of these three things i'll have either your resolution happens spontaneously or with some medical intervention if it is done in good time a okay, person may land up with complications so somebody has got a rhinitis may land up having chronic rhinosinusitis polyps related complications and other issues or you know other infective kind of complications and a similar thing happening in the lower airways also so they can land up with either mm, a very severe chronic bronchitis or bronchitis cases occurrence of uh, abca or bronchopneumonia you know sometimes you know it progresses to a very end stage kind of a difficult disease to revert and you know copd sets in for a lower airway uh, that was how the allergic rhinitis tends to kind of you know become important so uh, that was about you know uh, the basics of pathophysiology of it and there are several factors which contribute to the severity and the manifesting of nasal symptoms so these are basically the phenotypical kind of uh, classification or the phenotypical manifestation so you can have it as predominantly manifesting in form of recurrent infection or somebody would have something called as vasomotor rhinitis you know so some form of Uh, undertaking of physical activity bringing on vasomotor kind of kind of activation and release of uh, nasal kind of secretions and somebody who's got a nasal anatomical defect either a deviated nasal septum or turbinate hypertrophy or mucosal kind of uh, conchal hypertrophy some bachu especially tend to have adenoidal hypertrophy related issues and uh, then they also tend to have this obviously the septum plays a big role in uh, this and so deviated nasal septum by far is supposed to be the one of the most common kind of uh, accompanying feature of uh, allergic rhinitis quite often uh, non allergic rhinitis uh, not very common and we are not going to discuss that right now uh, we are basically focusing on our discussion in terms of allergic for disorders right here so these would you know contribute in some way or the other leading to either uh, either of all these four so if somebody would have sneezing or somebody would have rhinorrhea or somebody would just have a blocked nose so plus minus in severity from a scale of 0 to 10 each one each individual will have a different kind of a grade of severity there are no rules to it so somebody who would have a very severe kind of ig very high ig level but would have no possible symptomatic rhinitis and maybe you know more symptomatic in terms of the bronchial airway uh so that is where the in a united airway concept comes in a huge list of allergens you can see out here and they remain common even for the bronchial or the lower respiratory tract kind of allergy problem so if you were to summarize you know most commonly inhalational agents or allergens pollens the house dust mite is one of the most common fungal spore exposure uh, certain food materials food particles tobacco smoke and pollution or ambient pollution or even uh, kind of vehicular traffic smoke related pollution they are all also being considered as allergic kind of a propagating factor uh, uh, the number of sibling diet housing you know in fact these have a reverse kind of a association so the more the number of siblings you have the less the chances of you having allergy the uh, the 
the more westernized the diet you follow more refined you take in terms of food the worse it is you know the faster it manifests the more severe you know it is in terms of manifestation of illness those who have a uh, inferior level of housing or you know are not living in pakka houses they tend to have lesser symptoms those who are you know having more air conditioned houses you know wall to wall carpeting and you know um a lot of upholstery around them they tend to be exposed more to house dust mites and a lot uh, you know, fungal spores will colonize these uh, surfaces and you know uh, housekeeping of course uh, again that is an affordability issue and of course an individual to overall hygiene now overall hygiene over the last 6 months i think the globe has uh, uh, undergone a major change in terms of personal hygiene kind of a response and i think that's going to go and further propagate itself we will see its impact on allergic disorders also in the coming years but till now what we have seen is that those who have poor hygiene personal hygiene will tend to have more severe symptoms how do we go about managing allergic rhinitis so the three main pillars would be primarily avoidance of allergen uh second would be pharmacotherapy and the third would be in terms of you know immunotherapy or desensitization and uh, reduction of sensitization of that individual this is how we would actually approach any allergic disorder for that matter not just um, rhinitis and uh, visa we the first thing that naturally as a clinician we are supposed to do is uh, palliate or alleviate the symptoms of our patient and you know provide them immediate relief and that is where you know the gist of the talk lies today uh, prevention of complications and all for every Ill- illness and for every individual will be a different ball game that will be an individualized approach and that is the art of medicine we all practice so the huge list of pharmacological agents which are now available in terms of ther- therapy kind of thing you know uh, for uh, these kind of disorders and uh, we decongestants nasal saline which are used to kind of you know keep the airway kind of clean that is for the nasal i am talking about intracholinergic anticholinergic agents so and leukotriene receptor antagonists they have been used along with antihistamine for a long long time promoline sodium also has been you know in high favor with our pediatric colleagues omalizumab i was just talking about anti ig therapy omalizumab or the uh, mabs are basically you know the new kind of kid on the block or the kids on the block and you know they are going to or they claim to kind of make a significant impact and revolutionize the management of allergic disorders uh, none of them in isolation would work without the impact of an anti inflammatory therapy so corticosteroids either predominantly preferred in a topical form whether it is you know with the nasal sprays or nasal pellets or you know uh, if it's a lower respiratory tract you would want to have them in any inhaled form with an inhaler several devices available for that also and uh, uh, finally a combination plus minus and addition subtraction multiplication of all of these and you know you try to kind of you relief to your patient from the trouble some symptoms which they have so uh, what are the present state of the uh, state of the art guidelines on uh, how to use these the leukotriene receptor antagonists have been accommodated in the part of you know the pharmacotherapy for allergic rhinitis and of course they remain important in terms of therapy in asthma we will come to that and uh, we also use a lot of anti histamines they have been used in fact they are the first anti allergens that came out in you know our medical practices and so they after steroids are you know the first line of therapy uh, topical steroids as i just mentioned you know that anti inflammatory remain the top of the card so you choose either a cortico steroid and if you are not very keen about it you know in its topical form also if or if the relative is not very open minded and the patient is a small kid you may consider using just a uh, combination of an anti histamine and leukotriene receptor antagonist i'll not focus on arctic area too much because i am not talking on uh, skin problems today or allergic disorders on a general basis 
you all know that uh, you know these are the patches that you see and this is it is also a part of recommendation for um uh, to use antihistamines as a front runner in therapy for uh, urticarial disorders coming to lower airway inflammation and you know uh, asthma or bronchitis or allergic bronchitis uh, so a very similar event occurs out here also so you have a trigger or you have an exposure to kind of one of these allergens and a sensitized individual that sets off the cascade course you know that in the blood stream especially focusing on the tracheal bronchial mucosal kind of a tissue surface and so they tend to have inflammation and hyper in, hyper secretion of mucus the airway smooth muscles start getting irritated and goes into a constriction kind of a thing and that is not a continuous thing often more often it is a spasmodic thing triggering both of these as well as a nagging cough and uh, you also tend to have what is known as you know a uh, swelling of the bronchial membranes or you know an actual mucosal hypertrophy this leading to uh, narrowing of the pathways which you know uh, involve which are involved and we have a single airway kind of a leading inside and out of the uh, uh, respiratory tract and so any problem there is going to be really difficult to overcome and needs to be addressed clinically manifesting again in cough wheezing shortness and chest tightness or difficulty in breathing in so let me tell you that you know asthma and copd for that matter are obstructive airway disorders and the difficulty generally not so much in breathing in as actually to be in breathing out but uh, that is how patients tend to describe it that you know i am not able to get my breath in that is because what is happening is there is some air packing happening inside so there is hyper inflation which is occurring at the uh, small airway and the distal to the small airway level you know and so because of that built up of air the uh, there is an insufficient negative airway pressure which is generated and so the flow of air which should come inside is not adequate enough and the patient patient perceives it uh, the cns of the patient perceives it as a lack of adequate breath or inability to breathe inside so the global initiative for asthma is the parent body which you know sets out guidelines and almost every year we have updates coming in from them uh, it's a it's a respectable body uh, and you know uh, we do look up to its uh, updates every now and then and it does keep on making significant changes you know trimming around and just like a gardener is you know taking good care of this uh, plant the the group tends to kind of come out with significant changes in terms of therapeutic recommendation well on an individual basis every patient guidelines are always guidelines and they are called guidance they cannot be taken per dictum they are not the law and what we need to understand is that if you have an individualized patient who is you know behaving differently or responding differently we need to modify your approach in that situation accordingly and do not stick all the time to bookish kind of a practice by and large of course it will save your neck but it will not bring in bring out the artist in your self you know so medicine is not just about science but also about being an artist so you need to understand the finer aspect about it so coming to asthma and the role of uh, antihistaminics and leukotriene receptor antagonists so we do have this recommendation being given very clearly for step 2 and more severe asthma so step 2 step 3 step 4 and step 5 or uh, these levels of asthma uh, you can always introduce a combination of or an antihistaminic along with a leukotriene receptor antagonist rather than just focusing on an sos symptom based reliever practice which is recommended for step 1 step 1 asthma is occasional mild symptoms which you a patient perceives once in a few weeks to months 
And for such patients, you do not need to give them regular controller therapy or regular anti-inflammatory therapy. That is the current concept or the current belief. Let me tell you that there are studies which are looking at the idea of treating almost every single patient with a controller upfront and you know try to minimize this sort of a uh, SOS use of um, reliever. And once you do that, um, uh, we realize that changes uh, do come into picture and you know uh, they all also tend to have this. Uh, improved outcome. Of course, that remains a domain of some other talk some other time. But uh, right now, let us focus on our present kind of a molecule. So, uh, coming to the central theme of the talk today, we are talking about antihistamine. And so, we like, currently are say, having two generations. And uh, I think the third generation will be coming up sometime soon because, uh, you know, we have been waiting on these for a long period of time. And chlorphenidamine, doxepin, hydroxyzine, diphenhydramine, the first generation, as you can see on your screen, they have been here for donkey years, you know, they are probably older than what I am and probably what most of you in practice would be also, you know. Uh, of course, we would have some octogenarians and septuagenarians with us and they, of course, would, you know, remind us that they are older than these molecules. But um, the second generation of molecules have come in over the past 25-30 years and, uh, you know, have made a significant impact in terms of outcomes and management of uh, allergic airway disorders. Commonest, of course, has been cetrizine, desloratidine, and levocetrizine to come up with. Then came loratidine and um, mesolastin. Then came fexofenadine, ebastin, and acrivastin. Last on the block is this bilastin, which we will talk about. And, uh, and the topical antihistamines, uh, olopatadine and azelastin, I am I'm aware of and I have used. The other two, I am not very aware of. Levocabastin, Epinastin, I don't know whether they are actually available in India also or not. And if they are, maybe, I'm not sure. I've never heard of them, never seen them being used by any of my colleagues as well as my ENT colleagues. Uh, what went wrong? Why do you need to have generations or, you know, step up in terms of research in medication? So reduce the potentiality of side effects and maximize the therapeutic benefit with a improved therapeutic range at an affordable cost. You know, summarizing it all in one, you know, that making the ideal kind of a pharmacological product or the ideal pharmacological uh, molecule. You know, you should have all of these features in kind of a single packet. And it should be easy to take. That is another thing. So, what are the common problems with uh, antihistamines that we have been facing? And especially our seniors have seen a lot of these. We, of course, have not been using much of the first generation antihistamines, except I think probably now chlorpheniramine maleate is the one which is, you know, being rampant to use even now in the government sector. And uh, occasionally we need to use it in the ICUs as well as in the oncotherapy department or when biologic also. When you want to kind of avoid a major allergic problem, you the first drug that comes to your mind is chlorpheniramine maleate. So old ultimately is you know not to be sold. It has an element of gold, and so keep it on hold. Keep it there with you. You cannot discard it all the way. You know. They do have these impacts, so they have, you know, significant CNS penetration leading to significant drowsiness and sedation. They are also known to have impairment of memory and cognitive problems. You can also have effects on the bladder leading to muscarinic activation, dry mouth, urinary retention and sinus tachycardia. I'm not sure of how many of you have seen increased appetite and weight gain with these, but uh, I mean, it's well described in your textbooks. I have never seen it happening in my practice though, because probably the dose that I use is very less. 
to cause that problem of serotonergic so third scopolamine alpha receptor kind of an activation and you know so that increases your postural hypotension tendency and you know leading to giddiness and occasional falls and the most important is you know what everybody is now aware of the qt interval which from kaka speaking too much about qtc of hydroxychloroquine everybody is aware of qtc and what have a kick can play so almost all people everybody has read about ventricular arrhythmia and its in relationship with these kind of a thing and so uh, even before a patient actually becomes eligible to receive uh, hydroxychloroquine you know he is going to have more commonly a cough and a cold and so this is very likely that he or she might be prescribed a antihistaminic to relieve that because ultimately it's an influenza like illness so a qt interval prolongation is one of the major significant effects which is known to be associated with the first generation antihistamine what is i will come to bilastin later on so in that sense what are you looking for so you're looking for these things that you want something which is you know better in terms of uh, pharmacodynamics there should be no effect or very little effect on terms of cns penetration and effect in the neurology so mood depression or even drowsiness and with a good therapeutic kind of a potential so the window should be significant so that you can escalate your dosages get a good therapeutic benefit without kind of needing to stop the medication and uh, they should not be kind of you know affecting kind of significant performance parameters especially for people like in driving field or people who are you know in a high kind of a uh, risk profession so somebody who is you know in the our medical field surgical field or aeronautical kind of a thing the defense personnel and um, they need to be aware all the time they cannot have the guard lower down even for a few moments and so uh, this becomes very important there should be very little drug interaction of course alcohol lorazepam not very commonly accompanied but you never know you know the patients are strange and funny and you always need to watch out for interactions with these kind of commonly taken or ingested substances and uh, again coming to that that cardiac effects you know everybody is very afraid of cardiac effects and so the qtc interval prolongation or impact on the qtc itself is you know a, a put off thing for a lot of people to prescribe in fact i have had interactions about hydroxychloroquine and relative safety with a lot of my colleagues as well as seniors and you know a lot of them concur on this part that if you have a drug which is you know cardioactive and you know going to create some mischief somewhere you are not very sure about it you would be skeptical to use it on a large scale and uh, for a drug like an antihistamine which is you know in our country unfortunately it is something like an otc you can always come land up in a position where you will kind of you know uh, expect your patient to have uh, been carrying it around for some time even before you thought of prescribing it uh, so that is how you know uh, the idea of getting uh, this molecule or that is the place for Uh, new molecules in terms of you know research and that is how bilastin has come into existence that you know these people in the pharma research kept on looking for newer improvements and so how does it work so bilastin has a very high specific affinity for h1 receptors and does not look at other form of or h2 receptors or h3 receptors h2 receptors obviously you know they are responsible for the parietal cell stimulation and secretion of gastric acid so a significant and focused impact in terms of you know h1 receptors primary in the respiratory tract with excellent anti histaminic and anti allergic properties equivalent to almost equivalent to or probably slightly better than the existing one with a quick onset of action which is has you know the duration of action somewhere around 3 to 6 hours which is decent enough that is half life is quite good you know that you have a 20 near 24 hour half life and uh, blood brain barrier crossing is negligible so the risk of 
you know having cns side effects is negligible there were a lot of claims every time that tetrazine came in first and they used to claim that it has less sedation than chlorpheniramine maleate and hydro hydroxyzine and then levocetrazine came in as a levo isomer and you know probably less so then even when you launched or when you came up with uh, fexofenadine you know fexofenadine the usp was that it is absolutely kind of non sedative and i'll tell you that in my practice i have seen patients who feel very very dopey even with fexofenadine so i mean um, getting it totally absolved of that sinful part of you know putting a patient to sleep Uh, you may not be able to completely get rid of it, even for newer molecules or the newest molecule here. But it's just a reduction in terms of you know the possibility of getting it. And so, uh, as you can see out here, you know where you have excellent bio oral bioavailability. As I was telling you, you know that you need to have a medi medication which is easily uh, uh, administrable. It should be easy to take it also. and uh, we all in our practices have seen that you know indians are phobic of taking sprays and inhalers so if you have an oral medication you know that is what they would grab at first you know ye de do mere ko mere ko wo nahi chahiye you know if i were to put all these options in front of my patient on the table and ask them to make an informed choice and even if i were to write the efficacy in front of them each one of them i know pretty well and i think most of you would concur on that front that they would always choose an oral medication till the point of time that you elaborate on the fact that okay this is topically available this is a higher local bioavailability lesser side effect at a nominal higher cost you have to sit and explain it to them but otherwise up front we are all takers for oral medication you know not even an injection or a depo injection for that and a huge amount of and this is not a pro drug or a, it's a proper proper kind of a molecule which is there in place so you don't need to rely on the patient's metabolic status or the patient's inherent health state in order to kind of you know expect that the molecule will work or not has negligible interactions no interaction with cytochrome p450 is like a great blessing negligible changes to be done in nephro or hepatic dysfunction patients and uh, though that makes it relatively safe now this is something which was very interesting when i was going through the slides and you know so this is uh, it is claimed that you know bilastin um, has a very low level of sdlp that is the standard deviation of lateral position i never knew about this term before i read about it let me be very frank with you and so that is how uh you know they determine the safety of a molecule or a medication which is going to be consumed by a auto driver with i mean the automobile may be anything so it is not necessary that it has just to be a four wheel automobile it could be a 16 wheeler used truck also but more or less the same thing you know so and uh, so what you can see here you know that this is a individual who has taken hydroxyzine and uh, the lower one is one with a conventional h1 antihistamine and this is one with a uh, bilastin intake you know and uh, this is how they are moving at 100 km per hour interestingly you know and uh, they could you know check out the wave of swaying of the vehicle on the road without any other impact in the terms of you know headwinds or side winds or you know the road contours or anything of that sort on a uniform track uh, you can see significant less swaying of the car and uh, you know that means that more or less the the neurological system is in place and intact and not affected by the medication and so this is uh, safe for bilastin for doses up to 40 mg all the higher uh, the extreme end of therapeutics is 80 mg that is a four fold increase in the dose and let me tell you that in clinical practice in respiratory allergies you hardly ever need to use that those who have urticarial disorders you are free to use that level of a dose not in respiratory you don't need to you need to enter kind of add in anti inflammatories and better kind of molecules 
this has no effect on the qtc interval apparently that is what is claimed so uh, you know makes it quite kind of uh, acceptable in terms of you know medication uh, in current kind of a guideline sort of a definition criteria and uh, i think uh, so interaction is there with food not with other medication so this is interesting you know so you have to take it either one hour before or two hours after having a meal a huge list of all these we have already mentioned about it you know the most interesting part is that yeah it is effective on anaphylactic reactions as well as the delayed type type 3 and type 4 reaction and so your uh, later part of the allergic cascade and uh, you know the re relapse of the allergic re reaction also will be effectively taken care of to some extent and uh, so that sounds very kind of you know attractive in terms of uh, prescription medication to have it you know especially when you are using it in combination uh, with any other inflammatory controller sort of a thing say even a leukotriene receptor antagonist makes it a very sensible sort of a medication and uh, so comparing comparing it to cetirizine vis-a-vis -vis hexafenadine the two of the highest prescribed antihistamines currently you know so it is very similar in terms of potency and efficacy to cetirizine uh and supposedly more potent than fexofenadine i don't know how this can kind of you know go down but that is how it is so uh, and uh, you also need to understand that over a period of time with most kind of medications especially in this field of allergy you tend to develop what is known as uh, tolerance or tachyphylaxis and uh, that is probably due to receptor down regulation and you know an absence of effective receptor number to be blocked um and uh, out here that has not yet been studied and does not seem to be there uh, will time will tell us efficacy wise it is supposed to be quite good and you know comparable to the con con concurrent kind of existing antihistamines and um, you know some quite often you know superior to one or the other in terms of one particular area of kind of uh, preference say for example you know if you were to take up intermittent and persistent rhinitis it is as good as eslorotidine uh, not superior to cetirizine that is what is said but uh, you know uh, again that is only when you use it in a real time practice you would realize that negligible side effects you know so there is hardly any cns impairment even you know even at 80 mg oh, that's a significant claim being made you know that would be a pretty risky sort of a thing to do in a respiratory patient or a, a, a rhinitis patient or you can always you know check it out but most important is you know the, try to use it as much as closer to possible as a lower therapeutic level you know rather than checking out for side effects no anticholinergic effects no weight gain and no cardiac effects so that makes it kind of very safe uh, this is a treatment algorithm well very, very frankly uh, you know i am not a guy who you know thinks too much about uh, having algorithms all all the time you know they do help they are more like an sop but uh, not always you know relevant so uh, so for bilastin alone you would use an allergic rhinitis alone for an asthmatic you would want to use say something like bilastin or loratadine or upatadine i mean uh, if you have you know somebody who has associated uh, cardiovascular disease again bilastin you would use or somebody who has hepatic and renal failure again you would want to use that or somebody you want to offer alert kind of a state of mind you know somebody who is an flight personnel or defense personnel so all in all that is how you know uh, a take home message my take home message today for us would be that you know for every new molecule that comes in uh, of course every pharma will always claim that you know their drug or that this molecule is the best and you know it is the watershed kind of a moment in terms of practice we need to understand that first of all look at it whether it is affordable or not and whether it is 
tolerable or not to our patients if it offers a bouquet of things like what they are claiming for bilastain you know that uh, it is you know having minimal interaction with other drugs or rather none at all and uh, if it is safe enough in terms of cardiac hepatic and renal coexisting comorbidity i mean it's always worth kind of you know taking that opportunity and you know utilizing it and seeing to it whether you know it justifies the claim which has been made and uh, ultimately time will tell the truth so we will come to know about it sooner or later yeah till that point of time let us you know uh, join the party and you know uh, make the best of our practices and try to help our patients the most right i think i i, I would we can take questions sir yeah yeah we are open to questions uh how do you place bilastin amongst the other peers practically clinically is that a question for me yeah yes sorry please come back again uh how do you place uh, bilastin clinically uh, amongst the peers uh, like yeah so in the current kind of uh, armamentarium that we have in terms of anti histamines especially the generation second generation anti histamines let me tell you that the uh, the needs and the uh, the uh, kind of prescription preferences for all of these tend to change with individual preferences also your experience is also bilastin has been now for almost 6 months i have used it in uh, quite a few of my patients uh, i do not have any study to claim so uh, i would not be kind of you know justified in making tall claims of a great order uh, for or against the molecule i find it to offer a very decent sort of a anti histaminic effect whenever i have used it in combination with the leukotriene receptor antagonist alone uh, it does affect and work on the respiratory uh, allergy kind of a thing if you have a coexisting uh, kind of a skin kind of a allergy i have found it to be relatively less efficacious that is my take on it and so uh, i tend to choose my patients and the prescription accordingly and uh, uh, i would definitely like to know what are the preferences of my colleagues out here today and what what do they think about it if anybody wants to give back any valuable input i am open minded about it because it's a learning process there is never an end to this and uh, we can never say i know it all it's a never ending thing and uh, this is how i practice so if you were to say uh, my first molecule of choice even today is natural the one which i have written the most so that is levocetrizine and bilastin i have been preparing since the time it has come we try to write it and learn more about it so there are some patient who we had a crossover with you know or not an official crossover or and my study or something of that sort but an unofficial thing you know we are not feeling happy or they are feeling dopey with levocet and you know they don't feel dopey anymore with bilastin having said that as i told you you know then there are a group of patients who have an associated atopic pruritus and you know eczematous kind of eruptions coming in again and again they did not fare too well with the bilastin sort of a thing and they needed to go back to the levocetrizine and you know they told me very clearly that we are happier with this rather than that and you have to respect it and understand okay fine no problem right uh, very rightly said by you as uh... Um, it's very recent introduction in the market it has to evolve over the period of time uh, clinically and as well as uh, uh, the studies and uh, thank you sir for this feedback uh, one more thing that uh, the combination of leukotriene antagonist and the uh, antihistaminics uh, what's its role in the asthma how do you place them how do you use central role in asthma management as i mentioned you know very clearly that Uh, asthma is a multiple kind of a pathway mediated inflammatory disorder and we are seeing that uh, more often than not episodic asthma is leading to chronic changes and chronic symptomatology now then 
uh, probably in the past we are seeing a lot of automatic coming to us more and more often and so we need to uh, have this thing very clear in our mind that we need to control our symptoms effectively and early on and uh, corticosteroids in the topical form remain the mainstay of inhaled therapy <laughs> and uh, we know that our patients are not uh, they are not open minded about inhaler therapy even today they would prefer oral medication there is presence of oral medication which is not equal to it but you know somewhere near to it so a combination of uh, uh, antihistaminic and leukotriene receptor antagonist is a little bit of a compromise vis a vis a glucocorticoid based regimen of anti inflammatory naturally but well something is better than nothing at all and so if a patient you know is not going to take the prescribed inhaler and or is going to fiddle around with the medication and it's not that they will not take they'll take it for some time but you know ab mujhe acha lag raha hai to maine wo band kar diya hai dawa chalu hai goli hai chalu hai goli se acha hai then if you are good about it no problem the problem with this combination is that the ltras are not recommended to be used over a long period of time not more than 6 to 7 months so you have to keep that in mind and so probably you will have to scale down and you know take off the uh, anti leukotriene medication after that period of time and just continue with the anti histamine till the point of time that symptoms resurface and you know you have to go back to step 2 therapy right right uh, there is question in ch chat box which talks about the 65 years old asthmatic patient and uh, uh he is on inhaler pump and he has been given acibrofilin sr in the night so how long acibrofilin can be used in the patient uh, is the question yeah so nice question of course not the kind of uh, not focusing on the present kind of thing but yes it is an allergic allergic airway disorder when we need to talk about it. so acibrofilin you know you need to understand is a part of or the pro drug you know which belongs to the methyl xanthine sort of a derivative group and uh, its oral bioavailability is reasonably decent in our once a day dosing for the sustained release sort of a thing if you were to put your question in the right perspective what you are trying to understand is whether it is justified to write it or not is that what you are trying to say yeah it is justified to write it or not or, or it if it is written how long it. how long it is justified to write it provided you are you know understanding you have taken a proper understanding of the severity of the patient's asthma i assume that this is asthma that we are talking about and we are not talking yes, about asthma yes asthma yes ah, correct so so if you have a stage stage 4 stage 3 or stage 4 asthmatic uh, i think uh, it's a fair bet nothing to lose if your patient is not well controlled with um, a combination of uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist antihistamine and a controller corticosteroid therapy uh, given topically primarily in an inhaled form and you want to add on to pay symptom relief there's no nothing wrong with using an uh, acibrofilin preparation i think it is absolutely justifiable and uh, it is very easily available also now so there's no question of you know it not being available in the initial days yes for the first couple of years you know it was not readily available compared to what uh, the derifilin and uh, aminofilin preparations were you know but now it is there everywhere probably i think it is superseding the kind of pre existing methyl xanthine congener uh, and uh, uh, yes it is justified in using it There's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely. That There's might always help a you to kind of that might even help you to taper down the dosages of uh, these anti-inflammatory drugs. Right. There's always a question that uh, uh, whether to, whether or not to use the anti-histaminics and leukotriene antagonist in the COVID uh, cough or you can say pneumonia. uh 
uh, and uh, practitioners, especially physicians, general practitioners, they uh, they have a dilemma whether to use or not. If patient have cough, uh, so, might be pneumonitis. Uh, let me tell you very frankly, all our esteemed colleagues out here, as well as you folks who are from the pharma, you know, COVID-19 right now, the pharmacotherapy part is a little bit messy looking. <laughs> And so, you know, everybody can make his or her own claim about it, you know, and, you know, get away with it. For people who are of a scientific inclination, that sounds very difficult to, you know, pass off. Give it some time. It will, you know, evolve. If your patient has symptoms which are really kind of troublesome, COVID-19 does affect the lower respiratory tract in a big way. It may or may not be clinically evident immediately. It may or may not be kind of radiologically evident at all. But if your patient has a cough, I don't think that cough is because of a post-nasal drip from COVID-19. COVID-19 does not cause a chronic rhinosinus. Usually yeah. the cough, correct? Right, right. Right, I, yeah. I could... So, um, so the cough is generally from a low grade ongoing bronchitic sort of a reaction and uh, well we also are looking at cyclosonide in its inhaled form there are studies which are underway in terms of anti-inflammatory therapy but that would be a corticosteroid again corticosteroids are recommended in an oral form anyway so why not use the other pathway, you know, why not kind of add on with a low gentle dose of this molecule as well. Because ultimately COVID-19, what it does is it, it's a pro-inflammatory event, nothing else. It just triggers of that inflammatory basket. COVID-19 is not like tuberculosis, it does not eat up and cause cavities in the lung or other organs. Right. Yeah. Uh uh, one last question on immunologicals, immunotherapies. Sure. The MABs. Yeah. So how do you use MABs uh, to treat the allergic rhinitis? And there are very well laid out guidelines for usage of MABs. They remain the forte of a specialist. You know, whether it is used by a chest specialist in a chronic refractory asthma or a eosinophilic, uh, chronic eosinophilic asthma or a very uh, difficult to treat kind of an asthma patient. And similarly, there are guidelines which are being laid out for my ENT colleagues also. I'm pretty sure about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the absolute eosinophil count, which is present in the peripheral circulation and the IG level. So let me tell you that that area is also in a flux state. There are new molecules which are coming out. Right now, we have about three or four molecules. Each of them has different indications. This is not the purview or the domain of this talk today. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many of my colleagues out here are chest and uh, uh, ENT specialists. So uh, I guess they would concur with me that, you know, we would confine that to our across the table discussions and fights in our conferences, you know, for the time being. There are studies which are going on. These molecules are new. They are, uh, and they are extremely costly. So, you know, you have to understand that, you know, even if you are tempted to kind of, you know, offer them to your patient, uh, uh, it's usually going to be uh, something where you have to be very careful about in terms of compliance that, you know, taking a single dose makes no difference whatsoever. Whatever may be the kind of antibody, uh, you know, map that you may use. You know? right. Yeah. So a single shot doesn't make any difference in terms of therapy. It makes a significant difference in terms of cost to our patients. And so you have to understand that and you have to make it very clear on your mind first. And so then comes in the idea of, you know, where to use which map. So, uh, Nepolizumab use karo, ya Omalizumab use karo. That's not a problem. You can use whichever you are more kind of, you know, uh, experienced with and which your patient needs in terms of, you know, justified in terms of your prescribing to him. So somebody who's got a high eosinophil count 
I think metolizumab would be more uh, appropriate. Somebody who's got a high Ig level, I, omalizumab would be more kind of uh, kind of uh, right. preferred. Again, uh, it's evolving. Let me tell you that you know. So another thing which happens with uh, pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy is, is you know that we learn over a period of time and things change. Indications improve, and uh, you know some indications are trimmed off also. So although the uh, the uh, the the patent holder as well as the uh, the companies which are making may make claims for and against whatsoever. Ultimately, you have to wait for what our professional groups and bodies come out with in terms of guidelines based on RCTs and uh, proper studies, you know, rather than uh, they getting carried away by uh, marketing driven sort of. A... Yeah, right, sir. Very rightly said by you, sir. Uh, being a uh, chest specialist and being a critical care specialist, uh, and in uh, this is a context of COVID. Uh, getting your time is very important. So you have spared almost more than one yeah, hour. I was very happy to get off the COVID thing. You know, There's no yeah. Problem. So you have spared that time for us. Uh, we are really blessed by, and uh, it's our uh, uh, heartiest uh, and what it's our gratitude. Either COVID, Thank you. Either COVID, sub jagah COVID hi COVID aisa ho gaya. So <laughs> we are not talking about anything else. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so that has become a, a difficult uh, thing. Even at social gatherings, or even on family Zoom meetings, or you know, even in friends Zoom meetings, isko hua, usko hua, ye kaisa hai, wo kaisa hai. That is what is going on. No, sir, getting you on board uh, and uh, the person like you and spending time for us Thank always. Thank you for having me here. It was fun to have. I mean, talk to you folks, and you know, really nice questions which you know my friends have put forth. I as I, I hope that I have answered them to the best of my ability. I know that I may not have satisfied everybody. Uh, then again, you have to give me time. So time is yeah, the best. We test. should be thankful. All of us, all participants, are uh, thankful to you. Uh, we at RPG are thankful to the participants. It's a pleasure. No problem. Yeah, for their participation and all. Uh, I would like to assure the participants that uh, the uh, video link of uh, this uh, uh, session would be available very soon on the YouTube that will be communicated to you. Once it is approved and uh, uh, edited version, once it is approved by sir, it will be uploaded. Uh, so no thank you so much to you, sir, to participants and to team RPG Life Sciences for sparing their time. Uh, I think we should have one screenshot of everybody on the screen. You know? I mean, try to get that. You know, you are the uh, you are the MOC, so you you probably have access to it. You know, had it been a, a conference room or a hall somewhere, you know, like our older days pre-COVID era, we would have all come together and taken, uh, you know, as many snaps as we would have loved to. You know, it's like now with our smartphones everywhere, taking photographs. Like this is uh, this is something webinar. We'll plan uh, RTM roundtable meeting where all would be a panelist. Your friends, sure. your colleagues, and yeah. you can just discuss something about you know your own um, uh, little bit about science, and then you can meet up and we can also meet up and we can have a chat on that. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, stay safe and good night. Same to you, Mangesh. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Team RPG, and thanks everybody for being around with us. Thank you. Nice. Bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye.